Real Stories Tapes True Crime is your new true crime podcast fix. In our first season, we'll explore suspicious deaths at a California hospital and a skydiver landing dead on a suburban driveway with a bag containing guns, drugs, and night vision goggles. To join our investigation, search and subscribe to Real Stories Tapes True Crime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. Imagine a crime-fighting team made up of a concerned doctor, an undercover ex-biker, and a shy biochemist. Yet this unlikely trio is what it would take to try and stop an accused murderer. Exhibit A, the DNA of a virus. It started with a love story. Jennifer Anderson was invited to a dinner party where her cousin introduced her to the guest of honor, Charles Sinyanga. Charles was smitten with her immediately. Jennifer was a recent university graduate back from years of travel, now managing a clothing boutique. Charles Sinyanga was a refugee from Uganda, a law student who narrowly escaped the repressive regime there. He fled to Canada, where he had enrolled at McMaster University and studied political science. At the time, the Canadian job market was proving inhospitable and Sinyanga was almost penniless. But Sinyanga was successful in another field. He could make himself irresistible to women. Though Jennifer Anderson was not given to casual sexual affairs, the day after she met Sinyanga, she went to bed with him. He did not wear a condom, but she was not concerned. She was taking the pill. AIDS only happened to gay men or IV drug users, so everyone thought. It was 1986. AIDS was still a relatively new disease. There was no cure. Doctors believed that it was almost 100% fatal. The result was often hysteria. This was the spacesuit era, when nurses and doctors, even some clergy, wore gloves, masks, and gowns to approach anyone suspected of having AIDS. Over the next year, Jennifer's health was fine, except for rather frequent colds and flu. But Sinyanga was suffering from excruciating headaches. She urged him to see a doctor. The doctor found he had swollen lymph glands, indicating the presence of an infection. Sinyanga conceded to her he probably had the AIDS virus. Before coming to Canada, he had had an affair with a prostitute who worked the university bars. Supposedly, he had even fathered her child. At that point, Uganda had the highest concentration of AIDS in the world. 25% of all sexually active adults had the virus. Both the prostitute and the child had died of AIDS. Even after his test came back confirming he had AIDS, Sinyanga continued to have sex with Jennifer Anderson. He never told her about the tests, and he never wore a condom. Around this time, Sinyanga and a fellow Ugandan borrowed money from friends and opened the African shop. Sinyanga was knowledgeable about the paintings and artifacts, and he had the passion of a salesman. Jennifer's ardor was cooling towards Sinyanga because he would make a date for Friday and show up Saturday or not at all. One day, Jennifer ran into a friend of her cousin's, Linda Booker. 
When Linda casually mentioned she was also having an affair with Sinyanga, it was the final straw. Jennifer stopped calling. Sinyanga never seemed to notice. Shortly after this, Jennifer went to give blood. The Red Cross, which had been screening blood since 1985, sent her a letter saying that her blood had been rejected. She was advised to visit her family doctor. When her doctor opened the letter, he gasped and said, Oh dear, I have bad news. You're HIV positive. You better not have sex with anyone. You were a walking time bomb waiting to go off. From what little she knew about AIDS, she expected to die within weeks. She was 26, single, the beloved daughter of a well-to-do family. And she just tried to adjust to the knowledge that her life was over. It was devastating. Jennifer went looking for a female doctor. That's how she came to Dr. Cheryl Wagner, one of the few women in 1988 treating AIDS. At this point, uh, I had a lot of experience with HIV, but most of my practice for the previous five years had been with gay men. So she was, I believe, actually the first woman I saw with HIV. She had just met this man, and she was so concerned that she may have infected him. Five days later, Linda Booker also went to see Dr. Wagner. She also tested positive for the AIDS virus, and the same man was also responsible, Charles Sinyanga. So Linda wrote him a letter clearly stating that both she and Jennifer had tested positive and, because of the high incidence of AIDS in Uganda and your promiscuous behavior, it is virtually 100% certain that you too are a carrier of the AIDS virus. The letter ended with the ultimatum that if Sinyanga didn't cooperate and reveal the names of his sexual partners so they could be contacted by an anonymous third party, she would allow her doctor to report him to the public health authorities. He didn't respond. Cheryl Wagner notified public health and a nurse was dispatched to tell Sinyanga that he was obliged to be tested. He was found to be HIV positive and instructed not to have unprotected sex. As he often did with members of the health community, Senyanga assured her that he always practiced safe sex and that besides, these days he was celibate. A year later, a third woman arrived in Dr. Wagner's office. She too was HIV positive. And again, her partner was Charles Sinyanga. At that point, I almost fell off my chair because um, this was one year later. This was clearly a new infection. This was a man who I knew been had been counseled, who I knew had knew his HIV positive status. I think as soon as she walked out of the door, I was on the phone to, to public health and asked to speak to the medical officer of health for Toronto. She persuaded the health authorities to issue a rare Section 22, forbidding Senyanga from having sex at all. Francine Dalton, woman number three, had met Senyanga at a rock concert. She found him very considerate. The first time they had sex, she insisted he wear a condom. He agreed, then pulled it off right before he entered her even though he knew he was infected and that he'd already infected two other women. Gradually, the relationship began to take on a familiar pattern. Sinyanga would make dates and show up late or not at all. Soon, there was a fourth woman. What would it take to stop this man? Amazing as it seems, what Sinyanga was doing, namely infecting women with a fatal virus, was not a crime in Canada. The reason? In a society of sexually active adults, it was virtually impossible to prove that one person and one person only was the source of a sexually transmitted disease. Around this time, Cheryl Wagner was following a case in Florida where a dentist was being sued by his patients for giving them AIDS. The scientists had shown that the virus that he had was genetically similar to the virus in his patients, proving that 
these patients had acquired the HIV virus from him. Cheryl Wagner wondered, could something similar be done in this case? Enter an unlikely hero. Dr. Michael Malpetit, 31, had recently joined the Federal Center for AIDS. He jumped at the chance to match the DNA of Sinyanga's virus to the infected women. Little did Montpetit know that for the next two years, this case would dominate his life, invade his solitude, and thrust him into the media spotlight. The women decided that they were, at this point, frustrated enough with the public health process and the, the, lack, of, the lack of protection that public health had given them, um, that they were ready to sort of take this very tentative foray into the, into the criminal side of the investigation. But if there was to be a trial, the police would have to gather evidence. The assignment was given to Inspector Terry Hall, a legend in the OPP for his courage working undercover with bike gangs. The women would have to reveal every intimate detail of every sexual encounter with Sinyanga and any other lover over the past year and a half. Sinyanga was just like a biker, except he didn't have a bike. In these kind of interviews, you have to get into very explicit uh, details with these women uh, as to the actual act that took place and, uh, every, uh, and every act that they had uh, performed with the man. And it's very, very difficult for them to uh, be interviewed and, and to discuss that sort of thing. One of the first women Terry went to interview was Joan Estrada. Joan was a star athlete from a financially strapped family. She'd always dreamed of traveling to exotic places, but money was an obstacle. Senyanga seemed the next best thing. They dated a few times. Then he took her to his place. He told her that he rarely dated and that she was special. Joan trusted him. After all, he'd attended a Roman Catholic seminary in Uganda and told her he considered becoming a priest. He promised because she was special, he would use a condom. He didn't. Within weeks, she developed a rash over her whole body, lost 15 pounds, and couldn't even summon up enough energy to get out of bed. Eventually, it passed. A year later, she found out she was HIV positive. She wanted to die at once to avoid the shame of people learning of her condition. Your, your victims are, are in homicide are dead. And now I'm dealing with an investigation where my victims are alive but dying before your eyes you know, as, you, as you do your investigation. And it's not like a, a, a bleeding uh, knife wound. It's, it's a long, slow death. Soon there was a fifth victim, Nancy Gauthier, a single mother. Then a sixth, Danielle Fitzgerald, who had been daped raped by Senyanga. He had insisted, even though she said no, that she wanted it. Michael Montpetit worked for months trying to identify the DNA of the women's virus. It was like hitting a wall with no way over or through it. It was very frustrating time after time to see my positive controls work beautifully, my negative controls not show anything as they should, and my samples not show anything at all. And that was very frustrating. Mom Petit was trying to replicate the technique used in Florida, but it just wasn't yielding results. Without his evidence, there could be no case against Sinyanga. A year went by. During this time, the women went back and forth about whether they would testify. It was very difficult for them because none of the women's parents knew that they were HIV positive. So the idea of testifying in a public trial was terrifying. I was concerned what that would do to their emotional health and also their physical health because stress does, can play havoc with uh, the immune system. Montpetit had been proceeding on the assumption that Senyanga's AIDS virus was a subtype B a North American strain, like the Florida dentists. But given that nothing was working, he decided to try something radically different, and it worked. Not only was Senyanga's virus different than the dentist, it was an African subtype A, 
a strain never before seen in North America. At Sinyanga's preliminary trial in February 1992, a big issue was the question of consent. The women had consented to having sex. They hadn't consented to being infected with a deadly disease. But would that distinction hold up in court? The star witness was Michael Montpetit. The reactions from all the women indicated that all of them shared HIV subtype A, which is not commonly found in North America. And that was a first very strong indication that these women were all infected from a common source. The women gave very moving testimony about the catastrophic effects on their lives and dreams from being infected with AIDS by Sinyanga. Their health was failing. They were isolated by despair and the stigma of AIDS. Joan was so suicidal, Dr. Wagner and others worried about her. The judge in the preliminary trial allowed two charges to stand, sexual assault and gross negligence causing bodily harm. But Montpetit had yet to prove that Sinyanga was the source of the women's infection, and that would prove its own incredible adventure. All he had left of Sinyanga's blood was enough for two more tests. There was no chance of getting any more. It was before defendants had to provide blood samples. Montpetit was nervous about using up what was left of Sinyanga's original blood sample. He'd heard about a method developed by two Australian scientists to dilute such samples to produce volumes of testable material. But though he could locate the microscopic molecules in the lab, he couldn't find the two scientists. One of the prosecutors was convinced that Terry Hall could do anything. So he asked the OPP investigator to find the Australians. Hall did just that in a couple of hours. Using the new technology, instead of having enough for two or three tests on Mr. Sinyanga's sample, I had enough for several hundred tests. The Australian technique worked. It amplified the sample 400 times. Meanwhile, the AIDS virus was further insinuating itself into the women's immune systems. They were getting sicker. By this time, Sinyanga had met and married Connie Neal, who felt that he was being victimized by the women and was determined to stand by him. Finally, Montpetit could attempt a comparison between the DNA of Senyanga's virus and that of the infected women. The day he discovered that the DNA profiles matched was one he'd never forget. I was ecstatic. I bounced around the laboratory for an entire afternoon when I took the picture and saw the material present on the, uh, on the gel. By June 1993, the trial was ready to proceed. The judge, Dougal McDermott, had a habit of making his judicial notes directly into his computer. Michael Montpetit testified that the DNA of the women's HIV was consistent with one another and with the accused, Charles Sinyanga. The conclusion? One person, and only one person, was responsible for their being infected with AIDS, Charles Sinyanga. All the women testified about the devastating effect of what Charles Sedyunga had done to them. But Joan Estrada's was particularly moving. I always wanted to have children. Now I can't. I'm 25 years old, and this should be the prime of my life. And what do I have to face? Death. Look at me, damn you. Are you proud of yourself? Sinyanga never looked up. The question on everyone's mind was why did Sinyanga do it? Why did he continue to have unprotected sex with women after he knew he had AIDS? He had a capacity to charm even the public health nurse who was seeing him, even the doctors who were seeing him. But underneath that, there was somebody who I felt all along was cold, calculating, and not confused about HIV. This was a smart man. This was a man with four or five years of legal training himself. I felt he knew exactly what he was doing. Um, not, and, and just didn't care. His lawyer at first argued that HIV didn't cause AIDS and that Senyanga was suffering post-traumatic shock due to the trauma of his Ugandan university days. With the evidence 
the way it was presented, the evidence was there, there was no doubt that he infected these women, there was no doubt that he knowingly infected these women, in, in my mind, and from the evidence that was presented. So I was, I was very confident of a, of a conviction. The judge said he would consider this decision and render it in a few weeks. He didn't have a few weeks. Exactly 13 days later, Charles Sinyanga died of meningitis, a treatable disease. Justice McDermott had already written 128 pages of his decision. He simply deleted the file. For the women, it was terribly frustrating because this was typical of Charles Sinyanga. He was always the man who would call up and say he'd be there on the weekend and then never show up. For them, it felt like once again he had done it to them. He had missed his final date. This man didn't get his just due. He took the easy way out. The women were left trying to deal with their shattered lives, afraid of having intimate relationships for fear of infecting partners. Words can barely describe their isolated and fragile existence. Francine Dalton recently died of AIDS. Cheryl Wagner cared for her up until the end. Terry Hall held her hand as she went into her final coma. More than a dozen other women who were infected by Sinyanga have come forward since the trial. Two others died of AIDS. This case brought two things to me. One is a deep appreciation for how easy it is to become engrossed in small details and to dissociate oneself from the ramifications of one's science. The other is how dedicated people really put their lives into what they do and how in some ways nobody but them can appreciate how much time and effort they and heartache they invest into these projects. The Sinyanga case was unique in so many ways, not the least of which is that there may never be another case where the infection so clearly came from one and only one person. There is still no law in Canada to prevent what Sinyanga did.